from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. God of all grace, you desire that none should perish, but that all would turn from their sins who has to live in your kingdom forever. Give us courage to speak about you, and we ask that you would continue to preserve and supply uh, for those countries, Israel and Ukraine, Russia, those countries that are involved in war even now as I speak. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. One of the things that I was talking about this morning in our Bible class was the word glory. We sung of it here just a couple of times. Glory has a twofold meaning. One of the most common uses, glory, let me go back, but one of the uh, most common uses is for the word glory, and glory is a word that we throw around quite often, we say it a lot, but then when we're come to like actually define it, it gets a little fuzzy. Glory means uniqueness. Uniqueness. That's one of the definitions. I mean, as we said in class, what is the uniqueness of a porcupine? It's got quills. What's the uniqueness of a hummingbird? Can fly without, I mean, stationary, so to speak. This is the glory of a hummingbird. It's unique like that. And you can go through the animal kingdom, all through the plant life, all of that, that is that particular species, whatever it is, that has a unique glory to it because God made it that way. And he likes it. We look at some animals and we say, man, why did God make that? Because he likes it. And it's unique. And that is the glory of that particular feature of that animal or what have you. And when we say the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we're talking about the uniqueness of God. That he's three in one. And that he loves us. This is a unique God. Now the other definition for glory is the word, well, it's the word kabod. It is heaviness, weightiness. And in some respects, it's kind of a Venn diagram uh, in Scripture. Sometimes it's really just focusing on uniqueness of God. Sometimes it's focusing on the weightiness of God. Think of Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. When they see our Lord transfigured, what they do? They jump up and down? No, they started chewing carpet. They got down on the ground because of what? The glory of God. The weightiness of God. And that He is too much. He is other. So that's the exact same word, a little bit different definition. All of that to say, don't even start your sermon clock yet. I'm not even started. The glory of Topeka, Kansas is Westboro Baptist Church. Westboro Baptist Church with the signs that show up all over the country, that's where they're headquartered, in Topeka, Kansas. And you can ride through a certain neighborhood called the Westboro neighborhood and find the Westboro Baptist Church and it is a compound with a 10 foot high wall all around this compound. And they've got all kinds of slogans and uh, uh, sayings out there. Uh, you know that it's Westboro Baptist Church as soon as you see it. Well that unfortunately is the uniqueness of Topeka, Kansas. They're known for Westboro Baptist Church and that's where they're located. It's interesting how on one side of the street is what's called Equity House. And it's painted with rainbow colors to show support for LGBTQ and whatever letter they've added since uh, to, to that, to those rights. They, they position themselves opposite on the opposite side of the street of the Westboro Baptist Church. People ride down there all the time to see it. Get out, take their pictures. It's quite interesting. And they even have their own. Equity House has its own uh, a Wikipedia site. And it says, Equity House is intended to stand as a visible symbol of love. And then as I've already mentioned, across the street sits the Westboro Baptist Church compound. People all over the world, they see that as a visible symbol, not of love, but of what? Hate. 
where they protest all kinds of people, including religious denominations who shy away from speaking about the holiness of God, the judgment of God, the wrath of God. So again, in your mind's eye, if you can just catch this for a second, one side says, love more, judge less. For love, as they define it, is to promote, it's to promote, it is to celebrate and encourage people to do whatever they want and to live however they please. The other side says, live holy lives. God is a righteous judge. Obey God's law or you're doomed. You know, there may have been a time when the equity house would have been laughed out of existence, but not anymore. This message of love conquers hate has become widely embraced, even amongst many Christians, which adds to the confusion that so many live in, especially among our youth. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 makes it very clear that Christians really shouldn't have anything to do with judging those outside of the church. That is to say, since unbelievers are not members of, as we just confessed, the one apostolic church, the jurisdiction of the church does not extend to them. I mean, look, why do dogs bark? Because they are dogs. Why do sinners sin? Because they are sinners. Why do pagans do what they do? Because they're pagans. I mean, you can force a pagan to act like a Christian, but not for long. You want him or her to be born from above, just as Jesus told Nicodemus. So that being said, Christians are encouraged to not only judge themselves, but also judge each other, taking the log out of their own eye before they go reaching in and trying to what? Remove the speck from their brother or sister's eye but doing so in light of God's law. What this means is, is that love and law are not opposites. You can't, you can't divide them and make them like in a tug of war between the two. They're not at war with each other. For, from our gospel reading, a lawyer of the Pharisees asked Jesus which is the greatest commandment, his answer of which you've all heard countless times, you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, which is a summary of commandments 1, 2, and 3. And then Jesus continues, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Commandments what? 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So the greatest commandment is to love God and to love the neighbor, which is exactly how we lead the divine service, is it not? After receiving the blessed sacrament, after having our sins forgiven, after the word of God, after his blessing has been put upon us, what do we pray? We pray, help us to be fervent in loving you and loving our neighbor. You know, many people like to talk about love, but they fail to identify exactly what it means. It's kind of like the word glory. Things get a little bit fuzzy when we try to nail, nail it down a little bit and try to understand the correct definition. Jesus teaches love as being the fulfillment of the law to God and to neighbor. Therefore, genuine love never disagrees with God's law. And God's law never obstructs genuine love. Again, there's no conflict between love and law, for love is expressed when we keep the commandments of God toward our neighbor. And God's law is fulfilled when our neighbor is properly loved. Now, these might be, I don't know, muddy waters for you this morning, so let's, let's, let's get down to brass tacks here. If you want to love your neighbor, and the way you do so is by obeying the fourth commandment, by respecting police and other authorities. And as we have seen, as of late, we've seen a lot of people not do this, primarily to the police, and that ain't love. If you want to love your neighbor, then obey the fifth commandment by not hating or murdering your neighbor, seeking rather to preserve life, especially those who are weak and in seemingly insignificant, those unable to protect themselves in the womb or at the end of their life. 
you want to love your neighbor, obey the sixth commandment by not sleeping with your neighbor's spouse. Furthermore, protecting marriage from all the ills of pornography and the blight of divorce. If you want to love your neighbor, obey the seventh commandment by not cheating others out of their property. Defending, actually, your neighbor's possessions. That's how you love him or her. If you want to love your neighbor, obey the eighth commandment by not gossiping and assassinating your neighbor's character, but work to defend your neighbor's reputation. So do you, do you see how law and love, they're like, they're not separated. They're actually joined at the hip. They're not on either side of the street, for the law actually defines what love is. Which means if one believes that he or she can love apart from the law, then what they're doing is they're just making it up as they go along. By the way, how do you love God? Well, you do exactly what you're doing right now by not despising preaching and his word, but gladly what? Hearing it and receiving it. That's how you love God. You love him as well when you don't misuse his name. Using it instead for what it is given for when you trust him above all things. His commandments 1, 2, and 3. The law is defining how we love. My point this morning is don't take your cues about how to love somebody else from a fallen, depraved culture that attempts to reduce the judgments of the law. And don't try to uphold the law without love. Those are deceptive paths to walk down. And get this, Jesus calls us to pour everything into this love. All of our thoughts, all of our words, all of our deeds, our whole life even, from beginning to end, is to love God and our neighbor, which is defined for us in the Ten Commandments. But what's the problem? We can't do this. Not routinely. Not regularly. I want to, but our love is so stained with sin and selfishness, it's contaminated. And what we prefer to do is to turn inward upon ourselves. We don't show this love defined by the law to God. We don't show this love defined by the law to others. Instead, we turn with it. Yet here's the good news. Jesus didn't just suddenly come up with these statements to answer this inquisitive lawyer who was trying to put him to the test. Love for God and love for the neighbor, guess who they ultimately describe? Jesus. They describe the life that he lived. For as you know, Jesus loved God, his Father, with an undivided heart, and he loved his neighbors as much as he loved himself. Our Lord Jesus looked at our loveless lives, witnessing the way that we sometimes treat our loved ones and the way we almost always treat the strangers that we come across. He saw the murderous, embittered, gossiping, and angry hearts that are the reason that we fail to love our neighbors. So he wraps himself in flesh and lives among us. He walks with us the same way that he walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden. Living among us, living his whole life perfectly, fulfilling the law to perfection in thought, word, and in deed, and with love. Jesus reached out with a love that was most often never returned. And yet that did not stop. And nowhere does Jesus' endless love for God and for neighbor shine more brightly than on the cross, where he took the most loveless hatred that we could muster. And instead of hating us in return, 
He loved us through it. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amazing. And this very love from the cross comes to loveless people like us. Not just poured out from Mount Calvary in our baptism, but poured out upon you when you hear His Word and when you receive forgiveness of sins in His blessed supper. His love never ceases to be poured out upon us. Jesus fulfilled the law for those who cannot keep it. Loving those who cannot properly love, filling you even now so that you may go from this place and show love, defined by the law, show love to your neighbors in thought, in word, and in deed. May the Holy Spirit help us in this endeavor. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord.